God got you. Have a good day.
Good morning. It is that time. It is time for the church to join together. And whenever we come together as the body of Christ, uh, we need to just praise the Lord. So let's stand together and we're going to sing, To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let's sing. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Just a few announcements. Uh, first off, my apologies for the Sunday school this morning. Some people got an email, some didn't. We've had a little snafu with the email system, with the computer system. So if anybody's familiar with computers, you understand. The request is, is if you didn't get an email saying that we didn't have Sunday school, please email Teresa because something in the system, they've lost some people's emails, and she's requesting you do that. Along the lines of Sunday school, at this time until further notice, we're going to withhold having Sunday school. But there's a possibility, and we will send out an email. And for those that don't, we're going to try to get numbers and make phone calls. We're looking at maybe having a system where when we live stream church, we may have something where it's pre-recorded to where we can have Sunday school on that if, if that will work out. Uh, we will, like I said, we will let you know about that. Uh, this morning, immediately following service, we're going to conclude our business meeting. So that shouldn't take but just a few minutes. So that will be at the end of service. And the last couple of things, a couple of announcements. On August the 4th at 7 p.m., the prayer walk that they have at Bowers, they're going to be having it at 7 p.m. It's going to be outside, so if anyone feels comfortable coming, they would appreciate anyone being there. And the last thing... If anybody's on Facebook, you've seen the young boy, Preston Wells, the little eight or nine year old boy, uh, sweet little kid. Uh, he sent him home, and as you all know, he has a rare form of cancer. Um, they're really not sure, but I have an address here, and if you would like it, you can get with me. I will get it to Re Teresa. The kid loves cards. He enjoys them. They say he's got home and hadn't been receiving any lately. And, it's something he looks forward to, so if anyone would feel led to do that, we have an address here for that. Didi said the cards are what's keeping him going. That's something he looks forward to every day, so if you feel led to do so. Um, and that will conclude my messages for this morning. your blessings. We pray you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done for us. We pray, Lord, now that you will heal our nation. You will take care of our church, take care of our church members, Lord. Lord, this little boy, we pray, Lord, that you'll just uh, be with him and his family as they go through this trying time. Father, we thank you for your presence today. We pray, Lord, that you'll just be with us, be with everything that's said and done today in this service. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated, and uh, we're going to continue to sing together. Um, it is it is encouraging to know that everything isn't under my control, that I'm not the one that is in control of, of this world, of what goes on, because I don't have the strength to do it. I don't have the ability to take care of all of the needs that need to be taken care of, but well, somebody does, because Christ has the power to do what needs to be done in our world and in our lives. It's the power of his blood that he shed for us that gives us the freedom that we have, that gives us our forgiveness, our peace, our hope, and uh, strength for each day. So there's power in the blood of Christ. Let's sing about that. There's power in the blood. Wouldn't you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. passion and pride there's power in the blood power in the blood come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb there is power power wonder working power in the prayer Jesus, your King, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the prayer. Power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. A marvelous new worship song that we have sung a couple of times, and I, I think it should be in, in our regular um, group of, of songs that we sing. Uh, it has a marvelous message. As you sing it, make sure that you read those words. Even if you have to just say the words and not sing them, I'd, I'd, it'd be great if you would just uh, make sure you're a part of this song. His mercy is more. Ready? What love could remember no wrongs we Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more
he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the
Leanne. Hmm? They're going to go sit down, and you're going to come up here. And that was it. They want to sing some more, and and I have to send them away. Sorry. Didn't they do a good job? I've got great musicians. I've got great people up here. Come and walk with me now Through the fields of newborn spring Through the flowers with a heart that's full of love for everything. Come and walk with me now. Let the rays of blessings flow. Isn't everything more beautiful since we have found the Lord? His love is all oh, so wonderful, filling me like never before. His love is for us all. His love is all oh, so wonderful, filling every day with a song and joy like the rain will forever fall from His wonderful love. Come and read from the Word and we'll search to as we read the many verses, as we seek to know his plan. Come and kneel and we'll pray for the things that he'll provide. Isn't life so wondrous and so full? God is by our side. His love is Good morning. My name is Denny Brinkman. I've had the opportunity and privilege uh, to spend a couple of Sundays with you uh, here at South Harriman Baptist Church and excited about the opportunity to come back again today and share God's word with you. Uh, Mike Gooch was uh, the, the opportunity, gave me the, uh, to come and speak on Men's Day a few years back and then Matt called me one day in a panic because he was going to be out of town and said, can you fill the pulpit? And so we're excited about uh, Matt having a new place of ministry and excited for your church because obviously God has something in store for you guys here in the next few weeks, few months, uh, as you find the next leader for your church. So I want to spend some time this morning in Matthew uh, 6, verses 14 and 15. So if you've got your Bibles, you can open them up there. Um, I was on uh, Facebook a couple of weeks ago, a couple a week ago, and I was been thinking. I don't know how many in this room have ever seen in this nation what's going on. I, I mean, I think about like Christmas of last year, how normal everything was. I mean, 
how quickly can things change? And I'm not talking about just little change. I'm talking about massive change. Like no college football this fall, maybe. I mean, how devastating would that be? I mean, for me, I, I probably have to go see a psychiatrist uh, for a while to figure out how I'm going to deal with that. But bottom line is, is I was reading a guy's post, and I want you to hear this. It's from 1787 by Alexander Teitler, a Scottish history professor, was talk about democracy. And he talked about the phases of democracy. And I want you to hear this because this is going to tie into what we speak about this morning. It says the, the, the eight steps of a democracy are this, from bondage to spiritual faith. Sound familiar? The, the pilgrims in bondage in England decide, hey, we're going, to great, we're going to exert some faith and we're going to come across the ocean on the Mayflower and we're going to found a country from spiritual faith to great courage. Revolutionary war. Here they are now, a new nation, and they decide that they're going to build up the courage to do that. From courage to liberty. And how much liberty have we experienced in our country and in our lives? Again, I mean, never in my life have I seen what's going on in our country today. From liberty to abundance. Now, a good friend and a, a man that I got to spend some time with, luckily, was a guy named Manly Beasley. And Manly Beasley was a, a, a guy that spoke on revival. Has anybody here ever heard of Manly Beasley? Spoke on faith. He was diagnosed with seven terminal illnesses can, uh, at the same time. Was in the hospital. God spoke to him. He was reading in Psalms. It says, and you will see your grandchildren's children. And Manly Beasley got up from bed, walked out of the hospital, and started preaching. The doctors couldn't figure out why he'd left the hospital. They didn't know what was going on. He said, yeah, I don't care what you have to say. God's already spoken to me. I'm going to see my grandchildren. See you later. From liberty to abundance. Well, what Manly Beasley believes, the greatest hindrance to revival was abundance. Right? Because if we've got everything we need, heck, we don't even consider heaven anymore. It's just if I've got the nice home. What more could I want? How much what does God need to give me? So from, from liberty to abundance. But watch this. From abundance to complacency. Now remember this was 1787. From abundance to complacency. So we just sort of sit back and we're all comfortable. And we got our stuff taken care of. And now it's just, you know, whatever. From complacency to apathy. Wow. Does that speak to the church? Does that speak to the church not here at this church? I'm saying the church in general in the United States. From apathy to dependence. Wow. They were talking about this morning on Fox News as I was getting ready to go to come. They were talking about this new stimulus package. And one of the debates is, are they going to continue the unemployment benefits? Where people are making more on unemployment than they were in their jobs. And people are having a hard time bringing people back because they can't afford afford to pay him what's going on and, and so the, all of a sudden now we're dependent on the, the government and then from dependence to bondage that's the cycles well my, my deal is when the guy posted that on his Facebook page my response is I think we need to return to, to number one as quickly as possible right I think we need to see God move in our culture and I think we need to see God move in our land where we can go from bondage to spiritual faith again. In essence, I think we need a revival. Does anybody agree with that? All right, so this morning, I want to talk about one of the components of revival that stops more than anything in the, in the Word. Dee Pinkert is a friend of mine, and Dee, uh, <clears throat> about, oh, 10, 15 years ago, God just started having people call him. And he would spend literally from 6 to 10 o'clock at night, four hours a night on the phone, praying for people to be healed. And God blessed that. And tons of the people that, that Diaz prayed with have, have seen miraculous healing in their life. Now, you, I, I, I know that healing in a Baptist church carries a lot of different connotations. Right? We, get, we go all the way from Ernest Ainsley to... But this guy's a credible guy, and the healings that he talks about are credible. The reality is, is D says that when he's talking to people on the phone, and they're talking to him about a need, and he starts talking to him about praying for them, and he'll sense in his spirit 
that there's something that's keeping God's spirit from moving in their life. And he'll stop and immediately the first thing he will ask them, is there any unforgiveness in your life? Is there anybody in your life that you've not forgiven that needs to be dealt with? Is there any unforgiveness? Now I think of, I could have thought of a lot of questions I would ask people. But to ask people about unforgiveness, what in the world is that? I mean, have you read your Bible lately? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Those are questions I would have asked. But D says every single time, the thing that stops God's power from moving in that person's life is the sin of unforgiveness. So if you'll stand with me, I want us to read Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to stand here this morning. We thank you for the, the word that you've given us. We thank you, Father, for truth. And we thank you for how it impacts our life. And we acknowledge this morning that we're in need of you and your power we acknowledge this morning that we are in need of not only your power in our lives, we're in, we need you in our country right now. And so I pray, Father, that you'll bless this word and that you'll have the power to move in lives as we, work, as we worship together. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for your love for us. For we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. So, here's Jesus. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says Jesus' words in Matthew 14 and 15 explain his statement about forgiveness in verse 12. Though God's forgiveness of sin is not based on one's forgiving others, a Christian's forgiveness is based on realizing he has been forgiven. I'm going to read that again. A Christian's forgiveness is based on realizing he has been forgiven. Personal fellowship with God in view in these verses, not salvation from sin. One cannot walk in fellowship with God if he refuses to forgive others. I think the biggest problem we have in the area of forgiveness is the forgiveness of ourselves. The first step before I can forgive others, I've really got to know how to forgive myself. Amen? I, I think the, the, the thing that happens to many of us as kids, I, I grew up in a Baptist church much like this one, only this one's bigger than the one that I grew up in. And you remember you had those offering envelopes when you came to church? And it had all the little six boxes you could check at the bottom. And I mean, my mom and dad, they would check. We read the Bible every day and we tithed and we did. We checked those things and we'd ask Jesus to come into our heart. And, 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 and that, that was what our salvation was. Forgiveness of sin is the, the absolute work of Christ on the cross. The biggest component of salvation is forgiveness, amen? Because without forgiveness, we can't have no relationship with God. But the reality is, the Bible says, He who is forgiven little, loves little. But he who is forgiven much, loves much. I, I'm 63 years old. I grew up in a little, middle, little tiny, tiny town in Clever, Missouri. 250 people. If you didn't dance, you didn't smoke, and you didn't chew, and you didn't drink, you were a Christian. Didn't have anything to do with And you compared your sin life to the world's sin life. What's the comparison in our life for sin? Is it another group? Is it another person? It's Jesus. That's the model. That's the standard. So when I look at my life and I, I have a tendency, I don't know that you do this, but I did this as a young kid. I'd say, well, I'm okay because I'm, I'm doing things they're not doing and I'm, hey, I'm great. The result is, is not understanding what forgiveness means. Because the reality is, is I think I'm somehow, because I'm doing these things, I'm earning my forgiveness. But is there anyone in this room that can earn their forgiveness? Not one of us. If we could, Jesus' death on the cross doesn't need to take place. But the reality is, is it goes back to that statement. Who is forgiven little loves a little. He who is forgiven loves much. I always loved it when 
I was in student ministry. The kid that had been in the worst position in the world that gets saved comes out and, man, he's so on fire for Jesus, you can't contain him. Why? Because he sees where he's come from to this. But in the church, we've been there and... I hate to say it, but there was a lot of adults that would sort of sit back with a jaundiced eye and say, well, we'll see how long that lasts. That speaks to people that haven't been loving much, does it? That speaks to people that, that are sitting here thinking that, hey, I'm, going, I'm okay. I didn't do what he did, so I guess he's going to have a different relationship. No! If we got what we deserved, we'd all be zapped dead in our pew right now because the wages of sin is death. We'd get crushed. So the reality is, is when we take a look at our sin, we come to church with these whitewashed faces and these suits and ties and we like to look all nice and nobody knows what we're doing when we're at home. They don't know what we're seeing on our computers. They don't know how, how we're talking to our spouse. They don't know how we're working with our children. They don't know how we're treating a co-worker. They don't know what business deal I just did. But when I come in here, everybody knows I'm just, hey, it's good to see you. Well, the reality is, is that if I'm going to be forgiven what Jesus said, what the, what the, what the uh, uh, commentary said was a Christian's forgiveness is, the, is based on realizing the person has been forgiven, I have to know that if I can sin and get away with it, there's a good chance I don't know Jesus. If I can sin and it not have any impact on my life, there's a good chance because the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit convicts us of unrighteousness. So when I'm sitting here and I'm doing things and I know they're wrong, but nobody else knows I'm doing them, the reality is, is I need to understand what forgiveness is about and when I receive forgiveness God knows where you're at he knows every thought you've ever had he knows every word you've ever spoken and he says that I'll take your sin and wash it as white as snow Psalm 103 103 12 says far as as far as the east is from the west so far he has removed our transgression transgression from us meaning that he's taken our sin when I say to him Jesus forgive me Forgive me for what I'm doing. Forgive me for what I've done. That he takes my sin and casts it as far as the east is from the west. Do you understand what that means? If I walk north, I'm not, this is, I'm not, I know if you, I'm geographically challenged, so I don't know which direction I'm facing ever, ever unless I look on the mirror on my car. My mom and dad, they were not geographically challenged. They just get in fights driving down the road before they had directions in your car and they'd say which way are we going based on whatever I don't know what knowledge they had but Harold we're going south no we're going east no and I'm going who cares but anyway so this is north if I walk north long enough at some point can I be walking south right see the Bible doesn't mince words there's a pole there so the minute I go by that pole when I'm walking north now I'm walking south But the Bible doesn't say he cast our sin away as far as the east from the north to the south. He says the east to the west. So if I walk, now we're changing direction, right? Now this is east. If I start walking east, is there ever a day I'm walking west? I'm going east the whole time. Do east and west ever meet? No. They're completely done away with. They're gone. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I've asked Jesus to come into my heart. I've asked him to forgive me. I've done some bad things in my life, and Denny, I just can't get away from him. Why is it that I'm reminded every day of why I messed up? Well, we have an enemy called Satan. He's called the accuser of the brethren. He's not just telling you what you've done in the past. He's reminding God of what you're doing. And so the accuser of the brethren, Satan, sits here and he reminds you of your past. And he tries to bind you up in what you've done wrong 
Because he knows if he can paralyze you, you will have no impact on the people around you. Now here's why I think this is a major problem in the whole church today. Because we are paralyzed as a body, as a faith in our culture because we have not experienced the forgiveness and understand how the forgiveness is actually working. And the reality is this. The Bible says that he's an accuser of the, of the brethren. There's a jailer and there's a prisoner. This prisoner's been in prison for years. And literally as he's sitting in prison, he's written every bad thing he's ever done on the wall. His wall is completely covered in his transgressions. The president of the country issues a pardon and tells the guy it's free. And they open the gate, but the warden walks down. And the warden says to him, you know what you are. You know you don't deserve to be free. Look at that wall. That's who you are. Look at that wall. Those are all the bad things you've done. Have you done this before? You don't deserve to be free. Why would you deserve to be free? Look at what you've done. It's not about what we've done. It's about what Jesus did. It's what Jesus did on the cross. And the miraculous part is, is we can get up and we can walk out of that prison. How sad would it be if that prisoner who'd spent all that time writing down all of that stuff on the wall. And the pardon is there and they open the door. And he refuses to leave because he believes what the jailer tells him. That he doesn't deserve it. I want to tell you something. Nobody in this room deserves the grace you've received from God. Not one of us. We weren't born right. We didn't have the right family. We don't have the right pedigree. Nobody in this room deserves the forgiveness that we've received from Christ. So in order for me to have forgiveness, I've got to first forgive myself. But there's something miraculous that happens when I forgive myself. Then I can reflect forgiveness to some other people. I was watching the Today Show several years ago, and I hardly ever watch NBC for anything. And I just happened to be there, and there was this story on, and it dealt with the area of forgiveness. I want, to watch, I want you to watch this story, and then we're going to talk about what happens after I've been forgiven and how I've, after I've been forgiven, and the, the impact on the lives around me and the clear reflection of Jesus through the act of forgiveness. Isaac, you can play it now. You see, if, when we, prefer to, we prefer to wait until we feel like forgiving. But if we do that, then our lives are dictated by our family. At the fire department, we work 24-hour shifts. And that particular day, we didn't get hardly any sleep. It was literally like three or four seconds to nod off and to cross the center line and, and to meet the other car. To forgive us, we don't think it's fair. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. I'm supposed to be a helper, the EMT and the paramedic and the fireman that, that helps in these tragic situations, and here I am, calls this. See, forgiveness makes us victorious. Two men of service, one a pastor, the other a rookie firefighter, forever bound in tragedy. For them, it's hard to believe over a decade has passed. I can still see it, I can still smell it, the horrendous noise and the glass breaking. When the grief counselor approached in the hospital, Eric Fitzgerald knew his wife, June, was gone leaving their 19-month-old daughter, Faith, without a mom. Faith's just sitting there playing on, on the little hospital bed with the, the nurse, and of course she sees me and just reaches out. I don't know what she understood, really, but she crawled into my lap and she just went to sleep. And I was thankful because uh, I didn't have to pretend that everything was okay. <clears throat> 
was at the hospital and a police officer came in and he said, uh, I don't know if anyone's told you, but June didn't make it. And then he also told me, he said, and by the way, she was seven months pregnant and the baby didn't make it either. Eric, you had the opportunity to really say to the judge, you know what, I think this guy deserves some hard time. What did you do? I remember uh, somebody said this in a, in a sermon. In moments where um, tragedy happens or, or even hurt, that there's opportunities to demonstrate grace or to exact vengeance. And I chose to demonstrate grace. The men knew of each other but endured their grief apart until the two-year anniversary of June's death. Matt Swatzel had stopped by the grocery store to buy a condolence card for Eric when he spotted him in the parking lot. Eric starts walking out of the grocery store. He starts walking towards my truck. What do you see in the window? He was just, just bawling. Yeah. And um, so I just walked up and I just hugged him. Um, I mean, it, you know, what do you say? You know, something, sometimes things are best said with no words. That hug must have felt like someone had just put a pin in two years of pressure. That was the, uh, the biggest relief I'd ever felt. He just said from the start that he forgave me. And uh, just hearing him say those words, um, it just impacted my, my life completely. They talked for two hours that day. And where you might imagine the relationship would end. I said, man, I don't know what you're going to say to this. I said, but I just feel like in my spirit that I'm supposed to stay connected to you somehow. And he's like, dude, I, I feel the same way. We knew it was something special. We just had this instant bond. It's unexplainable. It's just easy to talk to each other. Man, look at that man. deliciousness. We would just talk about life, you know, just how we're doing and just moving forward. And he said, Look, don't let this define you. Meeting with Eric, it gave me hope that we're going to be okay. Sports Illustrated, baby. Oh. As the years unfolded, strangers became friends and something even more. I'm witnessing a little bit of a miracle with you two sitting here together. There's a bond that we have um, that's unexplainable. He's like a big brother to me. You know, we have a lot of fun together, you know, as weird as it may sound and, and crazy, but we do. It's, it's unique. I can't say this is a beautiful story and it's got a great ending. It doesn't. It's nasty. It's real. And it's something that I'm going to struggle with for the rest of my life. Both men view their friendship as a sign from above. Another sign? Years later, Eric remarried and was expecting a child. The baby was born on the same due date as the son he'd lost. Forgiveness is not minimizing the offense. Eric practices what he preaches and raised his daughter Faith to choose love over anger. So next year, that means you're going to play varsity. Most likely. Yeah. Like I usually five. just say my mom got in a car accident. I just don't want people to think that Matthew's a bad person because he isn't. He just made a mistake. I just want her to know that she's loved. She's not alone. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Throughout her whole life, I'll be there for her. No matter what. So just seeing Faith, you know, holding my kids, it puts a smile on my face. It hurts, but it's the cards that we were dealt, and, and now it's our story together. It reminds me that there's grace, and there's hope, and there's good. I mean, June's in heaven, you know, and one day, you know, we'll get to all kind of hang out. And so, you know, God's a big God, and uh, I think that's gonna be a great day one day. Anybody see Jesus in that story? I believe our culture is looking for a God that works. Amen? I think society is impacted when God works. I can't imagine. I can't imagine what the firemen felt for two years. Knowing that he had 
killed a woman and her unborn child. Maybe you're here and you have similar experience. But I also can't imagine the feeling when the husband of that child and wife walks up to a truck and hugs him and tells him he's been forgiven. You don't have to kill somebody on the road to make a mistake. You don't have to do something really drastic to offend someone. And especially in our age of social media and everybody's right to have their opinion and we speak our opinion unfettered. We just throw it out there, no telling who we're offending with what we're saying. We've got a right to say it. And I want to say it no matter what. I don't know what their life would do if you went back and apologized and asked for their forgiveness or if the same has been done to you that you forgave them and spoke that forgiveness to them. Peter asked Jesus, how many times should we forgive someone? Seventy times seven? Seven times seven times? And Jesus said, no, you'll forgive them 70 times seven, meaning that you're going to forgive people for the rest of your known life if you're a believer. But where is that in the church? Where is that in the communities that churches are expected to be like to? Does the world talk about the body of Christ as this forgiving body? Is that their, is that their reflection of what the church is about? Is a bunch of people that are gracious and forgiving? Not the non-Christians I talk to. The non-Christians I talk to talk to the church as hypocritical, closed-minded, self-righteous. You've heard it. I'll tell you the way for them to change their mind is for them to experience what the firemen experienced. Or for them to hear about it. Now, here's, let me ask you a question. How in the world does NBC find that story and decide to commit six, well, the the interview, the whole thing went for like 13 minutes. That's the short version of the story. When they come back to the studio live, all of them are talking about this miracle that took place. When all the pastor did was do and live out what Jesus and what we've been talking about did that all sit around their their place talking about God miracles Carson Daly goes if you're a Christian you're supposed to be Christ-like and a Christ follower are you talking about in the most liberal news organization on the planet they're going to air that if that isn't God revealing himself to somebody I don't know what is But it only happens when we are obedient to what the Father has. Well, I got a question. The opposite of forgiveness is bitterness. The opposite of forgiveness is bitterness. I can let somebody control me for the rest of my life if they've wronged me. I can sit there and blame them and blame them and blame them and blame them and I can hate them and I can wish the worst on them. I can do everything I want to do. But the reality is this. The reality is is that as long as I hold on to that, all I'm doing is entrenching myself deeper and deeper in a bottomless pit of bitterness. Have you ever met a bitter person? I call them black holes. You know what a black hole is in space? It's a thing that you go through it and there's nothing there. I'm just telling you, there's negative people that are bitter and I don't care how much you try and do for them, they're like a vacuum. It just all gets sucked in and nothing ever pleases them. 
Bitterness is the opposite of forgiveness. This is what Beth Moore had to say about bitterness. If I can get this page to turn. Innumerable strongholds are connected to unwillingness to forgive. What's a stronghold? Is that something God has put in us? Or is that something the enemy uses against us? Strongholds are what the enemy does to paralyze us to have any effect on the culture around us. Innumerable strongholds are connected to an unwillingness to forgive. Left untreated, unforgiveness becomes spiritual cancer. Bitterness takes root and since the root feeds the rest of the tree, every branch of our lives and every fruit on each limb ultimately becomes poisoned. Beloved sister or brother, the bottom line is unforgiveness makes us sick, always spiritually sick, often emotionally and surprisingly often physically. Please keep in mind the forgiveness is not defined by a feeling although it will ultimately change our feelings. The Greek word most translated forgiveness in the New Testament scripture is ephemi, meaning, quote, the send forth, quote, or away, let from oneself. To let go from one's power or possession, to let go from one's further attendance or occupancy. Quote, forgiveness is our determined and deliberate willingness to let something go, to release if from our possession. To be willing and ready for it no, to no longer occupy us. God is not asking us to let it go haphazardly into the black hole of non-existence. Forgiveness means letting it go to God. Letting it go from our power to His. Forgiveness is the ongoing act by which we agree with God over the matter. Practice the mercy He's extended to us and surrender the situation, the repercussions, and the hurtful person to Him. Don't expect Satan to let you off the hook of unforgiveness easily. Be prepared to commit, recommit to forgiveness every single day until you're free. 2 Corinthians 2.11 wants us to forgive in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. The King James Version says we must forgive lest Satan should get an advantage of us. The Word of God clearly teaches that Satan takes tremendous advantage of any unforgiveness in our lives. Unforgiveness qualifies as one of the most powerfully effective forms of bondage in any believer's life. We cannot tolerate it. Yes, the stronghold demands serious demolition, but the liberty you will feel when you finally let go is inexpressible. Forgiveness is the ultimate weight loss. Forgiveness releases the abundant life that Jesus promised. Look at the story of the fireman. What happens if the pastor doesn't forgive him? What happens to both of them? Is there a negative impact on both of them? Sure there is. Is there any glory at all if nothing happens for God? Is there any chance NBC News runs that story two years later if there's no forgiveness? No, because that's just like the world works, right? I mean, the minute something happens like that, we lawyer up and we run to the first lawsuit we can file and we, become, we win the lottery. And still we're not happy because the money sure didn't ease the pain of losing the person. And so then we're out here trying to figure out how to get even. But look at the difference. How was Matt's life or Eric's life impacted? The fireman, not only, if you notice, he's talking about grace and forgiveness because he's seen Jesus in the pastor. Not only are they now not enemies, they're best friends. What an unbelievable story. What an unbelievable testimony. Anybody in the community that knew him, they could go to them and say, how in the world is this happening? And they'll be glad to tell them. They don't have to have some new Christian presentation on how to lead someone to the gospel because what they're doing is speaking what God has done in them. So what's God done in you? You won't find it until you're willing to forgive. What about the daughter? That was the most miraculous thing I'd ever seen. 
She's protective of the man that killed her mother. Did you hear her? I don't want people to think Eric is a bad guy. He just made a mistake. She's protecting the killer of her mother because her father chose forgiveness rather than bitterness. Because let's play this out. Let's say the pastor doesn't forgive the fireman. The little girl goes around the negativity. How far deep into generations does that negativity go? Does it stop at the daughter? No, because when she's married and has kids, guess who they're going to hear? They're going to hear about that stupid fireman that fell asleep at the wheel and killed her mother. And that kid is going to grow up with negative stuff about not forgiving the father. But because of what the pastor did and forgiving the, the, the dad had a generational impact on their family. So much so now both families are integrated. Wow, how opposite is that to where we are in the culture today? where we're being divided at every step we can make. Look at what the forgiveness did. It entwined. It didn't separate. It brought them back together. I don't know this morning if God has spoken to your heart about somebody you need to be forgiving. I don't know you from Adam. I just know what God says. And I know that in a church with this many people in it, and as prevalent as unforgiveness is, we've all experienced it. But I'm telling you this, if your desire is to be God's agent in this planet, especially at this time in our culture, we as a church, not just here at South Bay, every church in the nation, we have got to embrace forgiveness. This morning, if you don't know Jesus... I preached here the last time I preach here, I preach on the greatest miracle known to man is salvation. If you don't know Jesus, Luther, Mike Gooch, myself, people around this auditorium, we'd be glad to talk to you about how to come to Christ. But this morning we're not giving an invitation for you to come to Jesus. Surely there's people that have been brought to your mind as we preach here this morning. Surely there have been experiences that you've had, and it may go back generationally. It may go back to an aunt or an uncle. It may go back forever. I want to, in the invitation today, I'm just going to pray that the Spirit of God gives you the courage to be obedient with what He's spoken to you about. And this altar this morning can be a rock for you to be saying, I'm leaving this place changed. I'm leaving this place different. I'm leaving this house of God willing to be obedient to what Jesus Christ is asking me to do and acknowledging I need his help to perform it. So Sam's going to come and he's going to lead us in an invitation hymn. And all we're doing this morning is if you need to come and pray while he sings, you can come. Father, we love you. And we thank you for just the miraculous testimony of Sam and Eric. And I, Matt and Eric, and I pray, Lord, that you use their testimony. I thank you for the word that spoke to us this morning about forgiveness and the need for it in our life. And so I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here that needs to experience the power of forgiveness in their life and needs the courage to go be the forgiver, I pray, Lord, you give them the courage to be obedient to what you're asking them to do. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for your love for us. For we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone. 
can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. I feel like, uh, Isaac, I hope we've got another verse up there. Let's sing the next stanza together. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Brother Danny, thank you for being with us. Thank you for your message. Uh, the Lord has used you, uh, and uh, through his word, I can see a positive move in this church. I appreciate you being here. Um, the invitation is closing at this point, but it's not really closed. If you uh, need to speak to me or, or Luther or whoever, um, you've been given a, a message about forgiveness. Maybe you need to go speak to somebody. If that's what the Lord is telling you to do, do what God tells you to do. That's, that's what his children do. His children do what he tells them to do. Uh, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we have a business meeting, so just a few minutes will take us a second or two to set up. Let me pray, and then Luther will start the business. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for how you speak to our heart, how you speak to us, and you give us direction. I pray that we move in the way that you have called us. Um, in the days ahead, Father, we can, we'll see your hand working in this church. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do. We trust in you. We rest in you because we know we're not the ones in control, Father. You are, and that's the way we want it to stay. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be